Active investing can be exhausting. Chase them after earnings reports and media highlights to find the golden nuggets of information that give me investment clues in a minefield of opportunities that is the stock market. So sometimes I like to put the files away and kick it back with a beer and leave my money in the hands of boring, stable industries that don't trend on Twitter, but offer consistent returns and growth. One such example is real estate, or what I'm gonna be focused on in this video, real estate investment trusts, or REITs for short. I'm gonna give a breakdown of these companies and how I've identified the best opportunities in the market and the ones in particular that I hold a position in. Here we go. If you're fortunate to own any properties, then rental income can be a great return on investment, but many don't have the luxury of owning their own, let alone additional physical properties. REITs were invented by Congress in 1960 as a far more accessible method of investing in real estate through the ownership of equity in large real estate companies. Essentially, when you invest into a REIT, you are funding the operation to acquire further properties, which they rent out, and the profits in the operation are either used to acquire further properties and grow their operation, or they are returned to investors. This may not seem different to any other type of company on the stock market, but the key difference is that REITs have to meet certain standards in the operations that benefit the investors and keep them performing. 75% of gross income has to come from owning or selling real estate. 75% of total assets must be held in real estate or cash. A minimum of 90% of taxable income has to be returned to investors via dividends each year. This pressures them to continually reinvest into new real estate, which compounds their growth and creates greater returns for investors. As REITs have to continually reinvest returns to meet these standards, they should provide continued growth in equity for investors, along with several other key benefits. The benefit of real estate ownership without the negative practical responsibility of owning physical property. They can buy properties cheaper than the retail market as they don't have to pay tax at the corporate level. And this is one of the many reasons that they have high returns and some of the highest and consistent dividends in the stock market. And they are more stable than typical stocks, even during times of market volatility. Let's say, for example, that you plan to spend 250000 on a house to rent, and let's say you charge 1000 a month. You will likely see a large portion of this money paying overheads, the mortgage, maintenance, insurance, taxes, etc. But for argument's sake, let's say you keep half of it as profit. 500 a month is 1500 over three months, which is 0.6% yield. There are REITs trading with up to 8% dividend yields, but if we review a large sample of available REITs, the average is $101 a share. So 250,000 buys you almost 2,500 shares. Based on the average yield from this sample of 3.43%, that's $3.46 per share, or $8,569 a year, or $2,142 per quarter. And that's just sitting on your ass, letting an average performing REIT do the work. So imagine the potential returns if you pick a good one. And unlike a mortgage that requires you to have an initial deposit of say 10%, <laughs> You don't need that to buy into a REIT. Just whatever funds you have spare, the will to research and find a good one, and a trading app. Now there are negatives. Acquiring property means a large investment in the short term and requires a long period of consistent rent to pay them off. So REITs often carry a large and often growing amount of debt. With most of their returns going back to shareholders, they have less cash to invest in more property, and rather than take up further debt, they often issue more shares. This can be disappointing for shareholders more concerned about short-term stock growth. So it's no surprise that with current concerns over rate hikes from the Fed, REITs in the US market have taken a bit of a dive. But to investors looking for the benefit of real estate ownership and are able to hold out for the long term, this is a great buying opportunity. REITs exist in a range of industries, retail, medicine, realty, and various others, giving plenty of choice for investors who prefer one industry over another. Regardless of the industry, they mostly work the same, but different industries may present different operating costs, maintenance, administration, for example. Also, properties fluctuate in value, and this is more complicated to measure as depreciation changes with market conditions, which include interest rates, rental prices, market demand, and market volatility. Selecting a good REIT means understanding how to value them. So before I give you my pick list, here's a quick breakdown of how I've analyzed their financials and identified best performers. It 
because property values and maintenance costs fluctuate, price to earning ratios are not very useful in identifying a good REIT. The information investors normally use, revenue, profit, operating income, a bit dirt, etc., are useful to some degree, but REITs have to manage their income to the same ratios, so this won't accurately reflect performance. For example, if you were renting out two four bedroom properties, a £1 million or dollar Victorian mansion in the countryside, and a typical 250000 house in the suburbs, and rent was charged at 1% of the value, then revenue would show these properties are performing equally. But in reality, there is likely to be less market demand for an old mansion in the countryside. It will have higher maintenance and operating costs, and the landlord has to spend more time arranging repairs for this, meaning the tenant will likely be annoyed about the inconvenience and eventually move out. On the other hand, the modern house might be bringing in less rent, but maintenance and operating costs are lower. The tenant is happier, and so doesn't want to move out, so the rent is more reliable in the long term. So for REITs, basic income such as revenue and gross profit might represent the scale of their operation and drive the price in one direction or the other, but it doesn't represent a REIT's true performance. A stock riding high in revenues may drive up investor sentiment but bring lesser returns, and if it's a result of a hyped up industry, the stock could be in for a fall. On the other hand, a boring stagnant stock price might be a result of continued reinvestment into the REIT's portfolio and generate greater and more consistent returns in the long term. So what really matters is how cost effective a company is in securing consistent returns for their investors against changing property values, operating expenses and depreciation and market demand. So to truly value a REIT, there are three key measures of performance. The funds and operations model is more typical of operational income and accounts the administration costs of the property. Before depreciation and maintenance costs are deducted from operating profits, assuming these would unfairly lower a REIT's performance rating. Most REITs have a separate section for this, otherwise we have to rely on general operating income, which is not as accurate, but close enough. An advancement on FFO is adjusted funds and operations, which accounts for capital expenditures, that being the initial costs and depreciation of a property, along with the maintenance costs for their upkeep. But this remains a consistent mathematical formula, whereas the market is a lot more volatile. This is more accurate than an FFO, but isn't always provided, so we can always fall back on FFO instead. The next measurement is net asset value, which assumes the book value is less reliable than the market value of the property, which factors in not just depreciation, but market conditions. This could be said to be the true intrinsic value of a REIT, but it is also the hardest to calculate. If provided, it tends to represent the net asset value per share. If the company provides it, you won't find these figures on market screener websites and they tend to be buried in individual earnings reports. That's a deep dive nightmare for investors researching many REITs on the market, but fortunately for you, I've done the work. So to narrow it down, the book value is a good starting point. It provides a basic reflection on the current value of the assets against appreciation and liabilities. I've identified the REITs with a book value of three or less. I've deducted companies with profit margins less than 5% and deducted any companies with a dividend yield less than 2%. This filtering process has given me 13 companies to analyze. To filter these companies down further, I've gone over the earnings reports and in addition to the basic fundamentals, I've identified the funds and adjusted funds and operations, the net asset value per share, and the total value and growth value of their property portfolios. To point me in the right direction of the best performers, I've gone through the data and applied a basic point system, 1.4 positive fundamental, negative 1 for a negative, and 0 if they are stagnant. So now we'll put these through some elimination rounds. With all the data collected, if we focus on these three, Vornado Reality, New Residential and Starwood Property, Round 1. Fight! Net income is a mess and clearly declining. Looking at funding from operations, there is clear shrinkage in earnings, not growth, particularly New Residential, who took a big hit in 2020, possibly due to the pandemic. The changes to the portfolio value suggest there was quite a drop at the beginning of the year and a gain during the last half of 2021, suggesting they are losing value. Although they have been raising equity for investors, this seems to be a result of raising cash through property sales and dilution of shares. Whilst cash is one way of securing dividend payments to shareholders, it's not a long-term solution, the opposite of the long-term income that REITs should provide. As much as they have the highest dividend yield in the group, I think it's a value trap. So in this round, we have to be ruthless and all three of these are eliminated. KO. Our table is a bit tidier now and we can look at the next three underperformers. LXP Industrial Trust, Realty Income and Well Tower. Round two. Fight. These three are performing quite well in terms of funding and adjusted funding. So moving on, we have earnings per share, which is shown a general decline in all three. 
What is clear is that they are growing their portfolio valuations, but Realty Income has been taking on additional debt and diluting shares to fund this, and dividend payments haven't been compensating shareholders for this just yet. Although their monthly dividend payments might be a benefit to some investors, it's not worth more in the long term. LXP seems more stable, but they also haven't been grown by much. They have the lowest revenue and profit, which is going to impact their ability to raise funds for future acquisitions and bring returns to shareholders. So, Realty Income and LXP are eliminated. KO. Now we're making progress, so let's look at the bottom four. Eastern Government Properties, Well Tower, Digital Realty Trust and Postal Realty Trust. Round three. Fight. Well and DLL are clear winners in terms of funding from operations by their scale, although DEA is showing growth on a smaller scale. But for Well, their earnings per share is on the decline and PSTL is quite inconsistent. Where DLL and Well stand out is their growing portfolio size, which is far larger than the rest, but they show conflicting behaviour over the pandemic. DRL made a massive jump in acquisitions, whereas Wells sold off. As DRL's acquisitions have slowed down, Wells has increased and overtaken them mid-2021. What's impressive is that both these companies have been using their cash income to fund this, not by diluting shares. That's admirable, but looking at net income and profits for Well Tower, the damage on 2020 sell-off may already been done and it's had a clear impact on shareholder dividends. Well is eliminated. KO. By this point, we can focus on the underdogs, Eastern Government Properties and Postal Royalty Trust. Round four, fight. Postal Royalty Trust manages properties leased to the United States Postal Service, whereas Eastern Government manages properties leased to the US government, such as the FBI and DEA. Going through the charts, it's clear that even at this level, DEA is a clear scale above Postal. They both have increase in funding from operations, but in terms of earnings per share, Postal is a lot more volatile, and likewise with net asset value per share. DEA might be slowing down with their acquisitions, but this hasn't stopped their revenue or net income from growing substantially faster than Postal. But Postal's dividend amount has been catching up with DEA's. Although Postal was catching up, DEA has already established itself, and being reliant on the US government, we have to factor in the political elements. The USPS is run by the Postmaster, that is, the jerk known as Louis DeJoy, who was appointed by President Trump's lackeys, despite having no experience and having clear conflicts of interest with his financial ties to XPO Logistics, his former company even going so far as to secure them a $120 million contract last year. He has used his position to internally dismantle operations, crippling their effectiveness, particularly during the last election. This corrupt piece of shit has no intention to stand down and seems to be determined to run the business into the ground. This is madness! Madness. This is Sparta! <laughs> For that reason, a REIT for the USPS doesn't seem like a smart move right now, especially in the long term. Postal is eliminated. KO. So this leaves us with our top six, and as much as a top five sounds nice, I'm not going to kick out the underdog just because they operate on a smaller scale. Here's a breakdown of them all. Six. Eastern Government Properties Incorporated. Founded in 2014, they focus on the acquisition, development and management of built to suit Class A commercial properties leased primarily to US government agencies, including the FBI and DEA. They target and acquire the most critical buildings or projects that they then lease to the government agencies. They started with 29 properties for their IPO in February 2015, growing to 89 Class A properties today representing 8.6 million square feet, near 100% occupancy rates, with a weighted average lease term of 19.6 years. The stock has been mostly flat for the last five years, and at around $20, is at a price-to-book ratio of 1.48. As we know from the research, revenue and earnings have been growing year on year, and during 2021, this represents a continued growth in funding from operations, both basic and adjusted for property values. Their portfolio has been increasing in value to $2.5 billion, and although they have reduced their acquisition activity, company assets have continued to increase, and for investors, thanks to REIT rules, this has kept their dividends flowing, and this is currently at around 5.10%, which is great news for investors looking for some long-term compound gains. Five. 
Digital Realty Trust. Formed and IPO'd in 2004, this REIT specializes in data center facilities. They started acquiring 21 centers through bankruptcy auctions and have grown to 285 locations across the USA, Europe, Asia, Canada and Australia. As the need for digital services grows, companies need facilities designed to accommodate their infrastructure and DRL are ready to cater for various industries such as healthcare, gaming, digital media, retail, finance and more. The company revenue and earnings have been growing well over the last few years, growing funds and operations. They have grown a substantial portfolio of property and although growth has slowed in recent years, 2021 saw record bookings for their services, generating great results in net income. The business has been generating cash through operations, not excessive share dilution, with a stable and growing history of returning dividends to shareholders. With their current 1.16 per share representing a 3.6% yield to keep their investors happy. Four. Innovative industrial properties. This REIT provides an alternative approach to investing in the cannabis industry by acquiring and leasing back properties to state licensed cannabis companies, freeing up capital for them to expand where they wouldn't have otherwise had the financing. Despite the political red tape that the US has been famous for, cannabis has been legalized in 38 states and Washington DC, and Fortune Business Insights predict the market to grow by a compound annual growth rate of 32.04% to $197 billion by 2028. The stock has been rallying over the last five years as the legislation has been freeing up, but it has taken a dive from its high of $286, but it still trades at around three times book value, which is high for a REIT, however, growth has been exceptional. Revenue and net earnings have almost doubled each year and shows continued steady growth over the last eight quarters. This is backed by their impressive growth in basic and adjusted funding from operations. The net asset value per share has reached a peak as has their growth in closed acquisitions and their EPS, which may explain the recent loss in investor sentiment. But the portfolio continues to increase in value at a steady pace. Liquidation of shares has been reduced and dividends have settled at a rather generous $1.5 per share and a yield of 3.51%, which is dope news for investors. <laughs> I've held back from this one in the past due to the hype around the cannabis industry driving up the stock price, but the recent correction and clearer indicator of its value, it's not bad for a REIT. Trading at around $200, it has the highest book value in the group, so I'm watching this to see it come down a little bit more and seeing less volatility in the US economy before I maybe buy into it. Three. Tritax Eurobox. This REIT invests in large-scale logistics real estate in high-value locations across continental Europe. They focus on long-term large-scale operations, which provide a secure level of inflation-linked income, high capital growth, and returns to shareholders via dividends. They are following a trend in online retail sales and e-commerce after this grew substantially over the pandemic, which has driven up the demand for property substantially over the last five years, and the lack of supply has driven vacancy down and rent prices higher. Their business model has never been more efficient, securing leases for up to 15 years in length and a massive increase in funding from operations, backed up by their significant improvements in the revenue and net earnings. Their portfolio size continues to increase in value after completing several high-scale projects by the end of last year, driving their value to almost 1.3 billion. Their 1.31 net asset value is a pinnacle of continued growth, which has been reflected in their generous 1.25 euro dividend, which represents a yield of 3.78% and is great news for investors in EU stocks. Two. Warehouse REIT. This specialist warehouse investor operates in the UK and since their IPO in 2017 have built a huge portfolio of warehouses for some of the biggest brands in the country, with Amazon being their number one client. This has helped them grow during the pandemic as they were able to collect 98.6% of rent for last year. They have performed considerably well above the UK FTSE market, averaging a compound annual growth rate of 14%. They boast an occupancy rate of 95.6 and seems to be capitalising on the increase in e-commerce demand, which has taken up the majority of space in their large-scale warehouses. 
from their portfolio growth, they more than keep up with the rate from their American counterparts. Just bear in mind these figures represent domestic currencies and are not equal. It looks like they will likely hit a £1 billion valuation by the end of the financial year, which represents over 100% growth in two years. Last August, they won Best Property Specialist at CityWire Investment Trust Awards after beating their competitors Big Box and Urban Logistics with a 58.8% return on net assets and an 88% shareholder return. Revenue and net income has been growing exceptionally well despite losing out during the initial stages of pandemic, as some customers opted to pay monthly instead of the usual quarterly arrangements. They more than made up for this during 2021 collections where we can see some exceptional increases. Net asset value per share has continually increased and shareholders haven't been disappointed with a dividend of 1.5p a share, a yield of 3.88% and great for investors who love a dividend. One. Tritax Big Box. Big Box is the big brother of eBox and shares similar interests in logistical warehousing, but solely within the UK. They focus on prime real estate, high tech facilities, and long term leases. Despite operating in a smaller market, they have grown a portfolio more than four times the value and continue to grow at a much faster rate, trumping the rest so far with almost a billion in income last year thanks to their market beaten acquisition rate. Funding from operations has grown exceptionally fast, even faster once adjusted. This brings incredibly good value to shareholders with massive growth in shareholder equity and a net asset of 218p. To top it off, they have a growing dividend with the next being dished out at 1.9p a share, representing a yield of 2.89%. Not the highest in the group, but one that stands to continue growing as the REIT keeps up the growth rate, which is great for investors who want long-term dividend income. <laughs> The amount of research that goes into stock analysis can be quite substantial, and REITs are a good example of how to customize your approach to make sense of the data provided. REITs are a great opportunity for investors willing to do the work and deep dive for the right information to form their investment hypothesis and benefit in the long term. It's not for idiot investors who just want to buy into basic fundamentals and expect the hype to give them a quick return. Although REITs grow their investments through stock liquidation, you have the most to gain by finding one that's already established a compound growth business model, with continued growth and growing returns to investors. I've highlighted my top choices in government, cannabis, digital and realty industries, and I've already been invested in, in warehouse REIT and big box. But the market offers a diverse range of REITs, so you have the option of investing into any sector that you're comfortable researching and following. They don't have to take up a huge portion of your portfolio, but it is helpful to invest enough so that dividends provide significant returns so you can reinvest into the same stock or another stock. So that's my take on this subject. If you liked it, remember to smash that like button. And if you have any stocks you think I should be covering or any thoughts, please comment below. Let me know. Now, out of the 19 stocks I hold, I've currently managed to deep dive 13 on my channel as I continue this personal project. So consider subscribing so you don't miss out on future videos. Until next time. <laughs>